everyone, and welcome to the 44th episode of Slime Time SideQuest, an official Dragon's Dead podcast. This is your host, Platy M3. And this is your other host, Yangus the Legendary Bandit. And tonight we have some exciting news to share. Ooh, really? What's that, Yangus? Well, tonight we are launching our brand new website for all things Dragon Quest Slime Time related. StewForYou.com. That's uh, Stu with a U, by the way. And with that opening, we have a great deal available for all the fans. Oh, shit. We finally got that website. I know Wootus has been working on it forever. Woohoo! Man, I, he's been struggling to grab that domain name for like a year now. I guess finally getting away from the W, moving it to the U for Stu is what did it, right? Sure is. Now our special deal I was uh, talking about is quite mm. the nice investment. For a mere $75, all of our fans can get the special physical release of Slime Time episodes up until now. That includes Slime Time, Slime Time Side Quest, all of the Die-related episodes, you know, mm-hmm. basically everything up to now. It's packed with bonus features like live cam, wacky sound effects mode, you know, just for the heck of it. Uh, three-month subscription to Dwayne's Foot Fetish Only Fans page, you know, for all those kinky fans out there. Uh, mm-hmm. we got behind-the-scenes footage and recordings, and there's even the long-lost episode. Oh, shit. Stu After Dark. All right, so what a deal, man. All that. Our listeners can get all that for only $75? What a freaking bargain. Who the hell yeah, and together? shipping is only $25. You know, I'm glad we're able to do this. We don't use Patreon, but it's nice that we can give something back to the fans. Um, all less than $500? It's what? sold out. Wait, wait ha- what? It's sold out. Oh, wait, Angus, we just launched it, right? I mean, this it, the podcast hasn't even, like, gone live. How the hell could it be sold out already? You know, that's a good question, but it's sold out, so I can't really say why. Uh, I mean, people are listening to this brand new as it releases. How are they going to get a chance to get the box set? They can't, I guess. I mean, and let's not forget anyone who hears this weeks, months in the future. I mean, we didn't even tell people if it was DVDs or Blu-ray discs or whatever. <sighs> Look, I don't know, man. It sold out so fast that we even lost the rights to the website, thanks to uh, stewforyou.com with the W in place of the U. Well, shit, man. I mean, I guess launching, like, this something like this at an awkward time has backfired tremendously but you know looking at our uh you know paypal account i guess it paid off at the same time i mean geez this is kind of awkward either way yeah you're telling me about all these blank t-shirts so we can make some new merch for the website and now i can't do anything with them blank t-shirts i mean can't you just return them no i wish i could see i bought them in bulk for the for the warehouse discount so unfortunately i can't return them but you know, speaking of bulk, I see that some of you guys are talking about games in bulk for tonight's episode, about our favorite games of 2022, Part 2. <laughs> Great transition, and I mean, you're right. That was a good way to get into tonight's discussion. Yeah, but you know, I, I do want to point out to the audience that you know all of us that from the last episode of this only went with one game per entry, and you know, we didn't double dip on anything, so I mean... Oh, shut up, Yangus. I mean, nobody cares about a single game or not. I mean, and after the failure of our website and our, like, collection, at least we're offering those people who care for more discussion some more stuff. But, you know, speaking of more, I mean, speaking of more, uh, we do care about all our guests out there. We're giving you more tonight. We're giving you more people to talk about favorite games of the year. And we're say hello to Evan Eel, Blue Star Bababooey. 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 And our local craftsman, Matt. He might be here. Hello, Matt. I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) He's busy crafting. Shh. (laughs) (sighs) All right. Well. It's uh, time to talk our personal top three games of the year. And even though some of these entries are way more than one game, um, we, we fucking cheated and I fucking took Yangus' line. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm glad you read that. I put in the notes for this episode for the audience. Um, I put in, so right at the very end of the opening, there's time to talk personal top three games of the year. Um, I then filled in, put after that, it says, even though some of these entries are more than one game, you bunch of fucking cheaters. <laughs> I mainly talking to, mainly combined. talking to Platty, but you know, just I just had to poke fun at. Oh, it. E- Evans is big as is big as a culprit here as me. So yep. I he's, would like he's to point out legit. that each of my entries is a single game. I followed the instructions. You did, you did as did well, Matt. You're just brown nosing. I mean, <laughs> <sighs> I gotta right. do something to stay on Yangus's good side. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, but you yeah. did that all right. You did yeah, that all right. I just had to throw that in there just to be funny, <laughs> just because I saw when I was doing when I was going through it this morning. I was just like, oh, Platty and Eel are just cheating. So you know what? we're gonna just throw that in. <laughs> but yeah, no, I don't really care. I just thought it was funny. <laughs> we'll uh, breeze through ours at least, or combine them in such a way that this doesn't go on for three hours. So don't worry. You, you got if you're listening to this, you're already looking at that time and like, oh wow, they're gonna get through a lot in that amount. Well, to help us get through a lot in a little amount, Matt, we're going to start with you tonight. I know uh, you got some limited time, so and I know it's a rare treat for us to have you here live. So why don't we uh, see what you want to get through to start, and then we'll uh, go to Blue, and then I'll hop in. Good Eve, good Eve. Good Eve. Well, everybody, since we're going to go by one game tonight, I'm actually going to pick one that I have a special history with. Everyone that's heard me already knows that I am an RPG fanatic. I've played just about anything you can think of and anything that I can find. One that I grew up with that still has a special place in my heart is, in general, the Ogre Battle series, ranging from Super Nintendo and on. One that I had the distinct pleasure of playing was one called Tactics Ogre, which combines the Ogre Battle storyline and classification system with an ever so lovely Final Fantasy Tactics vibe coming out on the PS1 in the 90s like everything else. It literally combined Ogre Battle with Tactics Ogre. You play as a distressed group of resistance fighters that goes to try to take care of a group of unruly Dark Knights only to find out they're not Dark Knights. And the story goes from there. You go through political intrigue that can make the lead a high roll from Final Fantasy Tactics throw up. Going from, I mean, it actually got a couple of remakes even. The PSP version came out, I'd say around halfway through its life cycle and completely put the game on its head with a better leveling system for your party as well as putting in cutscenes and all kinds of lovely little crap. One thing that it added was Coda and the World Tarot which lets you go backwards into the game to try different choices going from law to chaos and neutral, etc. Lo and behold, a couple months ago, it got another remake for all modern systems in forms in the form of Tactics Ogre Reborn. In Tactics Ogre Reborn, you get voice acting and the whole shebang. It's amazingly great. And I love it to death. I've played it about... Maybe four or five hours so far since I work 60 hours a week, but it's awesome. And I really ain't got much of nothing else besides it. I got to mute for a moment, so go on and I will be back. All right. So that was Tactics Ogre and uh, the PSP and the Reborn version. Sounds like Matt Krass has liked all three of them. Uh, Blue, why don't we jump to you for one of your games? And when Matt Craft comes back, we'll... Uh, Get another one in afterwards. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, So the first game that I'm going to talk about, I know we usually go in reverse order. This should probably be ranked higher for me, but we also just did an entire episode on it just last (laughs) week. Uh, So my first game I'm talking about for the the evening is Dragon Quest Treasures. And I'm not going to go too, too deep into it because, as I said, we did an entire episode on it just last week. Um, However, since then... Uh, I have put an additional 40 hours into the game. (laughs) (laughs) I still don't have all the dragon stones, but I do have all but one of the chests on the field in all the overworld islands. I've also, I've popped all the balloons. I've done every side quest I can possibly think of. Uh, I recruited a special monster, the very last one in the list, and made it to max level. And I have over 600 treasures and over 3 billion gold worth in my vault so i think it's safe to say that i'm having a great time and i'm continuing to have a great time although trying to find this final treasure chest is not that great of a time but i will find it it's gonna happen why don't you tell us about the two special monsters that we got codes for this weekend oh yes so this weekend we got codes for two special monsters that are voiced by you know some very I want to say prominent icons in the Japanese sort of community of Dragon Quest. So one of them is a King Slime that is voiced by the man himself, Yuji Horii. Um, 
That was a great surprise because I had uh, Platy just came into our chat one day and he's like, "Has anybody tried Yub yet?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yub? No one's talking about Yub. What is that? Where did that come from?" And then I typed it in and I got Yuji the King Slime, and it, you know, it's it's the cutest thing and it's so cool that they were able to include him like that. The one that we did know that was coming out was Pekote, who is a killing machine named after the Japanese VTuber Pekora. Um, and she's, you know, a huge Dragon Quest fan. I think she's mostly known for ca- uh, recruiting every single monster in Dragon Quest V on stream. So she did it live wow. in front of everybody. So she's a rabid Dragon Quest fan. So it's it's cool to see that they're including some real people among the cast of voice actors in these. Am I getting my animals mixed up or is she also a, a rabid Dragon Quest fan? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good one. I, I I don't know. that I know it's got ears and whatever. I, I, it does, I haven't it looked does at it. It does have ears because her design is actually based off of a Dragon Quest bunny girl. Oh, so there we go. So yes, yes. She's a rabid, rabbit Dragon Quest fan. <laughs> <Got> <laughs> and, and I both of their voice lines, or all, all their voice lines are in Japanese, even with our thing set to English, right? Correct. Yeah, because they didn't obviously... Make them it, speak in English. <laughs> it would be, you know, it, it, it would be weird to have a king slime named after Yuji Hori voiced by anybody but Yuji Hori. So, I mean, Pendy does a great Yuji Hori. <laughs> <laughs> does Yuji Hori sound like a pirate? Wait, you mean that wasn't the real Yuji Hori? What? Oh God, we fooled you just like his wife. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Oh <sighs> my God. I think everybody needs to go back to April 2020 and listen to that uh, episode. Oh, I know. It was April 2021. Sorry, April 2021. Oh, my God. Platy can't even get the date right. Oh, my I, God. Yeah, sorry. I, I'm fooling myself with the April Fools here. It's uh, I need more beer. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Lou, what is anything that you found that was, I don't know, surprising, amazing in the week since we last talked? In the week anything? since we last talked. S- uh, since you went really high level, since, you know, anything you noticed so, different new? Uh, you'll be happy to know that even I have six dragon stones now and the mm-hmm. enemies straight off the train are still like level six. Wow. So I'm level 99 <laughs> running around. Um, I will say that everything that spawns or all of the, uh, what's it called? All of the dispatch missions. So like all of the rival gangs that attack mm-hmm. you and like, we found a bejeweled monster. All of those are scaled to your, to my level and all of the okay. treasure dungeons are scared, scaled to my level. So those can get a little hairy sometimes, but otherwise I have a lot of attack metals equipped on Mia and I can mostly... It, the combat feels very similar to Dragon Quest build- Builders in that regard, because I just kind of walk up and wail on things until they die. Oh, um, nice. I did find a Princess Medea statue and a Munchie statue. Munchie is objectively the best treasure. I don't make the rules. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What's your most expensive treasure you found? Oh, my most expensive one. You know, I haven't actually checked for my plinths in a while. However, I think my Zenithian sword is worth almost $250 million at this point. So you're uh, probably already rank S in our uh, tournament on or contest on the den. I don't think I technically count as rank S until I actually upload the pictures. Oh, but, but you've checked yeah. the boxes at home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I believe. Well, no. Well, okay. I'm rank S because you left one challenge for buffer. And the one challenge that I have not done is collect all the dragon stones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whew. All right. Well, at least I uh, set a goal there that can be reached, maybe in less than 80 hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it's definitely doable in way less than 80 hours. All right. Anything else you want to tell us about treasures? Um, I think last... Did, did I mention that last week I was complaining that I had, had not scouted any monsters with hats? I have now scouted I... a lot of monsters with hats, <laughs> and it feels really good. Do you put them in your team or just leave them to ride the bench? Uh, Well, considering the... They come in at like level 30 and I'm level uh, 99 and all the gangs that attack me are level 99. It's not yeah. usually a great idea. I did change up my team a little bit and I'm now running a Emerald King Slime, uh, my same Heartless Hunter, Protect Eric, and uh, a Mag Montez. 
that I've been using to help me find the treasure chests with the scan ability. I have officially retired my white prints Aww. because I don't need the stuff. I'm a little dead inside with that one. How, Platty, <laughs> he doesn't know how old he is. It's time for him to retire. He, 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 he seemed a little... Bravo uh, with that un- word play. Yeah, yeah, he's a little incoherent <laughs> in my party, too. Bravo with that wordplay, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, honestly, I'm just saying what he says in the game. He's always walking around like, oh, I'm dead. Yes, he says, I'm dead happy, and... Yeah. <laughs> How old am I again? And like, it's, bro, if you don't if you don't know, it's time for you to live your golden years. Just hang out in the dorms and party. Yeah, do his little dance on the side in the mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. base. I did also find my Drakis making a uh, drag a Draki stack on the counter of uh, human resources. So that was really cute. <laughs> Anytime the Drakis do something, it's cute. Okay, uh-huh. I think that I think that's all my stuff. All right. So again, we've got a uh, very big thumbs up for Dragon Quest Treasures. I know I was a little negative last time. I was the voice of uh, the middle voice. Not not a bad game at all. And uh, if you're listening to these two episodes, you're probably a Dragon Quest fan. So probably a good idea to go out and get that one. All right, I will go now. Metcraft's a little busy, and I know Yangus has places to be and things to do tonight, so he wanted to stick around for mine before he uh, bowed out to uh, live up his holiday. Um, and he, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, right away, let, let's get to the, uh, the bulked-up <coughs> cheater version of the night. Um, I'm going to do a dual talk here and try to keep it to our 10 minutes or less. Um, this year, for the first time, I finally played Persona 3, um, and Persona 5 Royal. So got got through Persona 3 on my 10,000 mile uh, car quest this year where I, I met up with Yangus and Wudus and others and drove around. You can listen to our vacation podcast from the summer. Um, more about that. But uh, what I did mainly when my wife drove was play Persona 3, um, the PSP version, and played that on my Vita. Had a great time with it. Um, Persona 5 Royal. I got a little early for the Switch and did the review, or I'm still working on the review, but I had a big preview article on RP Gamer. Surprise, surprise, it's the same game you've probably already played before, but um, I played Persona 4 and like tons of the, all the side entries uh, before. I played Persona Q 1 and 2, Played I've danced with the 3 and the 5 cast, but I never played Persona 3 and 5 this year, and su- surprise, surprise, I enjoyed it. Persona 4 Golden um, I think when I played it a few years back, I said, my God, this is like one of the top five games I've ever played. Uh, put that in my personal top five. And I did enjoy Persona 3 and 5. Maybe not as much as Persona 4 Golden. Um, maybe just because, you know, here I am playing the second and then a third. Very similar game structure. Um, although Yangus will talk in a minute about uh, what he liked better with one of those and the other. But I just, I, I really enjoy the whole Persona series, at least the new Persona series. Um, haven't played one and two. I'd like to go back to two now that uh, there is a fan translation for the PSP version of the second one, I believe. It, both of them are now on the PSP, so I can do my portable gaming. But I just, I, I do love the uh, Mega Man Tensei battle system. I love the press turn system. Um, wh- one of my complaints about Dread Quest Treasures is, oh, it's not a monsters game. I don't get the monsters and breed them. Hey, I'm breeding the personas and the all the demons in both of these games. I enjoyed the breeding. And, you know, every time I level up, I'm like, ooh, who can I make now? Who can I make now? Um, level 24, what, what persona could I not make before that I can now merge together. Um, I, I do like the stories. Uh, Persona 3, I actually didn't mind too much going through the... Uh, I, I like how there's a little difference here. Persona 3 had the randomized dungeons, but Tartarus, I, I like getting in that. And maybe it's because I was just in the car and we're driving through, you know, wheat field number 764 in mile 9000, but it was okay to just, you know, run another floor, run another floor, run another floor. Um, getting in the flow of that. Uh, Persona 5, I thought they were very beautiful. Persona 5 had the set dungeons and a lot of set pieces in those dungeons and set puzzles and whatnot that made them all feel unique. Although, fuck that uh, big old, what was it, the cruise ship? 
towards the end of Persona 5. Oh my god, I hated that turning into mice. Dragon Quest VIII did it way better. <laughs> <laughs> like, if I gotta control men- Munchie, whatever, that's great. I almost called him Menchie because of the old Dragon Quest Builders promotion. Um, but if I gotta control Munchie, that's fine. Turning all my crew into rats like 75 times, going through those same puzzle over and over and over again. I was like, oh my god, the bank vault was so cool. Why are these just endless corridors and endless corridors in the cruise ship? Um, kind of wish Persona 5 Royal wasn't 100 hours, but again, it was a very enjoyable game. Um, still kind of breezed through it in about three or four weeks. Not Blue Star level, but, you know, married with two kids level. I did okay. <laughs> and <laughs> Just imagine and, having to do all that running around with touch controls if it was on mobile. Oh. God, no, 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 no. I'll leave all the 100 hours of mobile games to uh, those people who can do that a lot more than me. But I, I, I just, I really like the pace of the Persona games. And like, I, I, even at 100 hours, I thought Persona 5 maybe stretched it a little bit. Like, oh my God, I can't go into the dungeon. I can't go into the dungeon. I can't go into the dungeon. But, I, you know, for five hours, I was really enjoying the story bits. And then I was really enjoying going back to the dungeon. And Persona 3, I did the same thing. I would, like, the first day I could, I'd be in Tartarus and go all the way to the end. And I would just grind and get up there pretty high as fast as I could. And then just have 20 days to just go through all the stuff. And Persona 3, I got a lot more of the rhythm of the game. Like, who was available to meet up on with on Tuesdays, who was available mm-hmm. Thursday after school. Mm-hmm. Um, I got in 100 hours of Persona 5 Royal. I know they were probably on the same kind of thing, but I never learned the patterns. I don't, I don't know what was different about that. Or Persona was, 5 had a lot of like, oh, you must be at, you know, this that is stat true. to do that. And this. You must was, be this tall to ride the ride. <laughs> yeah. Literally, unironically. Mm-hmm. No, you're right. And I remember seeing that and yeah, I remember advancing, um, what is it, the student council president. We were supposed to go out. best girl! We were supposed to go have a double date with her best friend, but her best friend saw a picture of me, and I wasn't good enough looking to go on a double date with them. Oh my god, that bitch. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, you know, you gotta, gotta get your charm up. I'm like, well, you're about to get fucking sold into sex slavery, but I don't look good enough, so screw you, Makoto's BFF. So. Well, I mean, what about trying to be the harem king, you know? <laughs> I did. Uh, I dated all day getting dumped. Oh, that was great. Honestly, that was one of the best things in the game was Valentine's Day at the end. Um, I only romanced the adult characters. Um, I didn't romance any. Oh, wait, I did. I romanced. And it was kind of a last minute thing because I finished off stuff so early in December. I was like, well, whatever. I, ro- I romanced somebody. I think it was the new one. The uh, royal girl. Oh, um, the red haired chick. Yeah, and it was just because it was like, well, I've got like five more days in December. I've maxed out everybody I kind of wanted to, so eh, what else should I do? And I think I was kind of clicking through the options a little bit fast, too, and said the thing that leads to the romance angle instead of just the, you know, 10-star friend confidant, and like, eh, whatever, this is fine. But yes, I romanced the doctor, the teacher, and uh, the reporter in Persona 5. And Persona 3, I think I kind of romanced, like, just the party members. It was like, uh, I'll go through this. Um, but no, I it, oh, I think Persona 3, one of my favorites was the was it the guy on the bench dying of cancer. Oh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. I can't I, remember I, his name, unfortunately, but you meet him in the park. That's in the park, not too yep. far off from where the, um, the team lives at. Yep, I, I really, I like that storyline. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I like so this I, too. I, I, I really enjoyed a lot of the storylines in both. Um, in Persona 5, I got through all the ones that I wanted to. Persona 3, I didn't. Um, and I remember a couple times, like, just laying in hotel rooms at night, kind of like, ah, you know what? I'm never going to finish this person's story. So I'd, like, look it up on YouTube just to see how it ended. Uh-huh. Um, those are some good ones. But, yeah, I just, I, I, I'm glad I finally knocked these two off. These have been a long time on the bucket list. Uh, thanks to my work for accidentally buying me Persona 3. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I had the work credit card linked to my PayPal account to uh, buy some robots one point, and then a couple days later that popped up for sale, and I bought it, and Oops. PlayStation just oh, defaulted no. to that. I mean, it was all of like nine ninety nine. So when uh, the lady was going through the accounting afterwards, she's like, you spent like $500 on robots and $10 on that. Don't even care. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, I don't even care. She's I have a video game club. I've done 
them and Steam shit forever. I, I always buy. I'm buying boxes of Legos from random people on eBay. She yeah. she codes she codes it however it codes, and nobody asks a question. So, yeah. Well, to be fair, yeah, I guess, what did you want to? Yeah, it was ten bucks. Like, yeah, so that's not too bad. Anyway, sorry, yeah, Matt, I was going to say, you wanted to say something about Persona 3, I know. Oh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know a while ago we did that. You know, the games we didn't like. And I, you know, so <laughs> Persona 5, I think I think the game's fine. I definitely don't like the fan base for it. I, you know, I have my qualms with that. But, you know, I thought that one was fine. But I really enjoyed Persona 3 quite a bit. So I actually played the game um, during one of my J terms in college. I think it was my junior year, if I remember right. Uh, I ended up playing through the whole game um, for those four weeks that I had uh, January off uh, in college. And uh, I really I, I played it on the PS2, just to be clear. I played the, the Fez version, which was the mm-hmm. updated uh, release because it was at the time where you could still buy a bunch of or you could buy a bunch of PS2 games for like 20 bucks each brand new off of Amazon and stuff. So, you know, that's when I was buying like a bunch of Atlas ones and a bunch of others that I could, you know, for such a good price. But um, anyway. I had played it, and on a whim, I was like, eh, you know, Persona 4 was okay, but, you know, maybe this one will... I'll give the third one a try, and we'll see if it's more my jam. And you know what? It really was. I really... I don't really... You know, it didn't do anything too drastically different, but I just found myself connecting with um, Persona 3 a lot more. Um, I think it was because it was kind of more what I was expecting from something that's related to the Shin Megami Tensei series, where, um, I mean, you know, it's more of a character-focused story, but, you know, there is these kind of darker underlying elements to it, and there's you know this big threat with um you know tartarus you have to claim that and then there you learn about nix which is this um unstoppable force that could attack the planet you have this rival group of um i think they're supposed to be young adults or teenagers i don't really remember that also are persona wielders that can that show up from time to time i don't know i just i kind of liked how the setting um built up the bad the big bad and you know it kind of kept that as a focus you know, you had your first half of the game where it was like, oh, there's these 12 main uh, evil shadow monsters that we have to take out. Because uh, this was the game that introduced the whole um, shadow concept for uh, enemies because the, the first two games used the, just the, the typical monsters uh, mm-hmm. or excuse me, the typical demons. But they just called them personas instead. But this one made more stylized looks for them and everything's in it. Uh, indicated by a mask that it wears um but anyway not rambling about that too much but i just thought that what well, uh, excuse me i didn't really not, i didn't write notes for this so i'm kind of just going <laughs> off memory here but um i enjoyed the stories for the characters of persona 3 quite a bit like of the main cast and i especially liked how the characters were able to grow and develop um both by interacting with one another as a group but also from growing um on their own because I liked how, uh, rather than like with four and five, how um, the main characters could reach like their their strongest version of their persona by maxing out their confidant, they would have scenes where they were on their own, where they would you know kind of talk to them, you know, and kind of think out loud, or they would be like, well, you know, I have to you know do such and such, da da da, in order to you know uh, take things to the next level or improve myself. Like like one of my favorite scenes was with um this bit of a, you know story spoilers here real quick, but um. One of the scenes that I really remember and still sticks out to me is with Akihiko, who, after the passing of his best friend, uh, Shinjiro, he, um, you know, he feels real beaten down on himself. And he, you know, just feels terrible, you know, that he couldn't do anything because it makes it reminds him of his sister, who you can, you know, learn about as you interact with him. Well, on the scene on his own, you know, he realizes that, you know, Shinji would probably just be you know, laughing at him, being like, you know, don't be beating yourself up so much. And... Unfortunately, I don't remember all the details, but basically because of this, you know, he gives himself, you know, he gets that realization, like, you know, he shouldn't give up. He should keep, you know, becoming strong and being a good um, force for people to turn to if they need it and, you know, to help out everyone. That's when his persona then turns into uh, its ultimate form, Caesar. And stuff like that was what I really liked was that you got to see the characters not only grow from interacting with one another, but they also could grow on their own without um, being so heavily reliant on... um, everyone else i don't i I don't know if i'm really explaining myself very well with all this but um i guess i just liked how the writing was with this game in particular Mm -hmm. i'm kind of rambling on here but i also enjoyed uh, i'm sorry what i was gonna say did you do the uh whole the answer ending um you know i did most of it but honestly it's really difficult like like i Uh, that's what i heard that it was difficult and it was kind of like uh you know the payoff wasn't worth the difficulty no it's 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 really not. It was one of those things that eventually, like, I've played a lot of these other Atlas games on, like, hard and stuff, but boy, this, the answer really is, it's difficult. Like, it's tough, especially when you can't control, 
your party members with the, mm-hmm. the tactic system. You know, that makes that a, a lot harder. But um, that was the that was the reason I did the portable, definitely. Yeah. But um, people don't care for the answer either. Yeah, it's 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 kinda weird. It's not the answer they were looking for. Yeah, no. Exactly. No, I do like um I, I did like though that they you know changed a few things with that too. Like I will say like the opening for Fez uh, from PS2 is really good. I really like that version of uh, the main theme of Persona 3. And um, you know, getting away from the writing itself and the characters, even though I don't really think I did a good job explaining why I like it. Um, <laughs> I really liked um, how Tartarus was set up. How it's kind of that mystery dungeon style, and I liked how floor layouts could be a little more varied with like the twists and turns and stuff. Um, kind of versus what Persona 4 and uh, what 5 did with Mementos, which I know mm-hmm. you absolutely love that. Oh, play. Fuck <laughs> Mementos. I know you love that, but. You know, no, um, it, oh, I'm not going to mention it. Nope. Okay. I, I, all right. All right. Nope. Um, but yeah, like Platty, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I get a, I got a good kick out of the, the battle system, which, you know, it's always very good with Atlas mm-hmm. games. That that's one of their strong suits with any of these, um, uh, Megami Tensei related games. Uh, music. I, th- there's some songs from the game that I really enjoy. I kind of like how it has that strange kind of rap style to it. You know, it's, it's very, it's, it's kind of an odd soundtrack, but that's what I like about it too. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the final boss itself. Is so freaking annoying when you get to the last phase, and um, you know it's a thirteen phase like final boss before the the true final thing shows up. That's just a basically an automatic script thing. But I really enjoyed that last encounter because I thought the game did a good job, you know, building up to it. And um, there's still some kind of moments that kind of made me roll my eyes, like when the boys go to the summer camp or not summer camp, oh, they go on that yeah. summer vacation, and it's like. Well, we gotta go find a babe. Ha 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 ha. Let's go find a babe. Like stuff like that was just kind of like, okay, whatever. But um, yeah, overall though, I like I enjoyed Persona Three a lot more than I thought I was going to when I initially started it. I didn't expect I was gonna beat it in um, a month's time. That was that was kind of crazy. But because um, with these other games, I've usually had to like play them for a while. I set them aside, then I'll pick them up again like a month or two later. But yeah, I really enjoyed persona 3 quite a bit i thought it um i feel like it does stand out a bit more from uh four and five just with how its tone is kind of is and how it um you know just probably a better way to dissect it but i'd have to write everything down and kind of think about it more but basically i really enjoyed persona 3 i don't want to keep repeating myself too much on that um really enjoyed what the game did kind of this um darker sort of vibe to it uh by still having some of that lightheartedness you'd expect from the persona series and you know what for this being um the first time where they kind of started doing this formula, you know, I thought they had a good idea for getting the groundwork started. And then with uh, four and five, you know, obviously they kept improving on it. And, you know, as we all know with five, you know, that really, you know, took off for Atlas. So, you know, obviously it clicks with uh, the right, it clicked with the right group of gamers and stuff. Not necessarily for me, but I like three quite a bit. All right, uh, Matt Craft, you wanted to uh, chime in with uh, Persona 2 real quick. What do I have to look forward to if I get to uh, them? this year, this next year, should I say? <laughs> well, Persona 2 harkens back to the turn-based stuff. I actually was going to go more on how it's technically two games, starting with it is, yep. the, the yeah the innocent sin of... It's been long enough now. It's the innocent sin of forgetting Maya's death. Not really forgetting, but uh, purposely remembering Maya's death as Tatsuya is a simp and the eternal punishment that comes from after it with the universe basically collapsing. Persona 2 is your classic turn-based ye olde persona. Came out, but the, the one that we got originally was Eternal Punishment, came out on the PS1. Voice acting, even then in the battles at least. A staple of any persona of Sh- or Shin Megami Tensei, really, really good art. Uh, you star as Maya Amano, a not even a cub reporter. She's like a super reporter who is after the Deja Vu boy. And by the end of the game, you know Hitler is the first one. <laughs> Damn it! I had a, I had a mind part right in the middle of it. <laughs> You bet, during the game, during the oh. punishment, your enemy oh, God. is essentially the Illuminati. The main, the main villain of two is Niar Lefotep. As someone yeah. who's only played Persona 5, I cannot wait to get into the rest of the series. <laughs> oh, Persona 2, Persona 2 is great, and so is 1, but, but 1 is actually first person. It has a first person dungeon thing. 2 is kind of similar, but in 2... 
in Innocent Sin, you fight the legions of, you. yes, it's Neuralitev, but you fight the Mask Cult, who is draining the energy from everyone. And then you find out that basically a reincarnation of Hitler is behind the masked cult. Then you fight Neuralitep, who kills Maya Amano, who is one of the main party people. Yeah, she so. tells every she tells everyone to forget her. And then it goes into Persona 2, where that version of Tatsuya refused to forget her and managed to multiverse into another Persona 2 game, which turned into its own thing with the New World Order and having playable characters from the first Persona in there. You were going to yeah. say something? No, I was just going to say, like, <coughs> yeah, the, whole, the, the whole thing with um, the, the two Persona 2 games is that Niar Lethotep is the one that's kind of behind everything because he keeps disguising himself as different people, and one of his disguises is... Um, they well in the fan translation of the PS1 release they call him they just flat out call him Hitler makes him look like it but in the uh, PSP version that we got you know they had to obviously change that up a bit because be like oh that's a little controversial now so they just called him the Fuhrer and just like you know covered up his face with some or gave him some sunglasses and yeah, gave him a cool that. biker jacket <laughs> I wonder if Kanye ever played it but um yeah no um Niar Lethotep is a pretty cool villain too because he does appear in both and he's you know aware of what's going on in two of them and he's the one that calls out uh, Tatsuya for essentially screwing over the first timeline and um, I, I think these games have pretty interesting story and stuff. The gameplay is probably not going to be for everybody, but um, I definitely think you know this was a good you know it's a good way or it's good in terms of like characters and story writing and. Um, Actually, what's kind of neat is that with Persona 5, you know, Joker is the nickname for uh, the main character. It's actually named slash based off of um, the Joker that's in uh, this game, or sorry, in Innocent Sin, because one of the things that the kids do is there's this whole, you know, rumor system. And if you do a rumor that someone called Joker will show up and he looks, has kind of this like distorted clown mask sort of look going for him. And, you know, it's part of. I think, like when Persona 5 came out, you know, it was part of the anniversary for the series. So they were like, oh, you know, this would be a fun way to, you know, not only nod uh, one of the older games, but, you know, it'd be a good name for our protagonist. So there you go. A little trivia don't, for you. Don't forget that in Eternal Punishment, a Joker copy is the villain for the first like quarter of the game. So Joker kind of appears in both of them. Nice. All right. Well, let, let's get things moving around, moving on tonight. Um Matt Craft, uh, do you want to do your second game, and then we'll get to Evan? Yeah, uh, I originally was going to do my second game uh, with Pokemon Scarlet, but I changed my mind on that. I'm going to go for a much darker game. Let the wool be pulled over your eyes, because I'm going to go with Cult of the Lamb. <laughs> a delightful little roguelike where you play as a cute cute little lamb who literally converts every single animal he comes across to a diabolical cult meant to bring bring about uh, the apocalypse demon. Oh, good. It, it combines both a really, really good roguelike that really reminded me of Hades with a rather excellent town sim that will remind you of Animal Crossing, except they take care of it themselves. Hmm. You can't just ha let your cultists run around the field because they're going to shit and piss everywhere and no one's cleaning it up. That means they're going to get <laughs> sick and then they're going to die and then the game ends. So you got to take care of your animals. You got to feed them. You got to build them shelters, outhouses. Hold your sermons where you sacrifice them to the tentacle gods below. I can't well, uh... get it. I was th I was I was getting a Dragon Quest <coughs> Builders 2 vibe with the outhouses, and then sacrifice just totally came out of left field. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the main things you do. You sacrifice your people if they're starting to get old and decrepit. You don't have to let them die, even though you can let them die and harvest their body for food. You can sacrifice them instead and let them be revered as the greatest members of your cult forever until the next one comes along. Honestly, the bet. <sighs> You get mushrooms that you can force feed to your people to have psychedelic visions. I mean, come on. And the in the roguelike part of the game, you you obviously get abilities and level up through the game and stuff, but you go out you go through the labyrinths with your nice little hat that turns into everything from a two handed broadsword to a set of knuckle dusters. 
The combat honestly reminds me of Hades, where it's fluid and seamless. And honestly, even though the game itself is pretty short, you can finish it in about 20 hours or so, I'd say, if you're good. It has enough substance to it that you just want to keep playing until the very end. There's even, uh, if you're familiar with the Stupendium, it's a YouTube music group that does really good music covers for games. They did one that was commissioned by the game by Devolver Digital called Wool Over Your Eyes, which describes the game perfectly. Has anyone else played it? I heard of it. I know everyone's been talking about it the last couple months. Yeah, I mean, give it a go. It's a good price, especially probably during the holidays, and I really do consider, consider it one of the main contenders for Game of the Year 2022 because it's fresh it it has new ideas that i honestly haven't seen in a game in a long damn time i mean can you remember the last game you're over a cult and then it puts the whole hades vibe right into it which makes it even better to me nice plus you're a cutesy little lamb no one is ever going to suspect a lamb of wanting to murder your family and feed you to a dark god eh, you know it's happened once or twice i mean I never say never <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Matt Craft. Um, Evan, let's finally get to you. All right. I'm going to keep it short and sweet because I decided that this year uh, my games of the year would be a uh, trip, but a trilogy of trilogies. Yes. And my and my first one is the original God of War trilogy. And I feel like talking too much about it is kind of like trying to talk to people about, you know, describing people what Pokemon's all about. Everyone knows what Pokemon's all about. You you play as Kratos, he's Greek, he's bald, he's angry, though it's not because of the other two things. Uh, he has... <laughs> <laughs> no... I don't blame him if he was, but... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> no, he gets nightmares uh, of the time he killed his wife and daughter. And in order to finally rid himself of his nightmares, uh, he is working for the gods to kill Ares, the god of war. Uh, so what I thought was kind of funny about this game, what, or series of games, was... I had always heard about how he kills gods throughout the whole series, but really he only fights a single god in the first game. I don't think he fights any gods except for Zeus in the second game, and then the entire third game it's just killing gods after gods after <laughs> gods. So, so I was like completely off on this one, and uh, I, so. Basically, if I could describe what you do, basically while you're putting the hurting on soldiers and monsters by pressing the circle button a lot, uh, in between you'll be doing platforming and solving puzzles. Um, the platforming is okay to not great at all. Um, I remember one kind of infamous one where you have to climb up this tower where there's lots of spinning saws or blades, something like that. And if Kratos gets hit by it, he drops all the way down. And there was a trophy for climbing to the very top without getting hit once. And so I maybe spent an hour trying to get that one trophy because I figured I was never gonna go back to the game again afterwards. And then there's another one. So I was playing on my Vita and there's, there's a touch, it's a little, it's touch sensitive. If I remember correctly, you have to have them balance by tilting the Vita around. And he can walk on these balance beams. And there's this one bit of platforming where he has to cross all these beams. And if he falls, he dies. And you start all the way back at the beginning again. And I think I spent maybe hour and a half to two hours on that. And you couldn't rotate the camera to get a good field of view of everything. So you were kind of hoping that you weren't going to hit a dead end while you were crossing it. It was not great. Um, I played the first two games on Vita. And then I played the third game on PS4. And I have I didn't play any of the spinoffs, but I heard they're basically the same game. Um, I tried playing the, you know, the modern ones, but... After playing so much of the game a certain way, I felt like I couldn't do anything correctly because the controls are so different. And I was just, uh, and I just put it down and I haven't touched it since, which is crazy because it's the one that, it's one that everyone loves. It's just, it's just so different because you, you would press like you, if I remember correctly in the PS4 game, you use like the shoulder buttons for most of your actions and you use the triangle, um, uh, cross, circle, and uh, 
the square for all like these miscellaneous things like dodging, uh, commanding Atreus to do something, um, you know, interacting with stuff. So it, it was just very un uncomfortable when I got so used to just pressing circle, 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 circle constantly. Press the you know shoulder button to dodge. Press this button or no? It was um, it was flicking one of the uh, um, the control stick to dodge. I believe it was. So yeah, it was good, fun, you know, they're short. I think they're like maybe five hours each, six, seven or so max. Um, you can play the whole thing. If you're, if you're Blue Star, you can play the whole thing over a weekend. Um. <laughs> oh, please, that's one evening. <laughs> oh! Also, uh, did, do, do you call the X button cross? I believe it is technically cross. I also call it the X button normally, but I think it is considered a cross. I feel like that's... That that's just uncomfortable. I don't care if it's wrong. I'm gonna keep calling it X. <laughs> but yes, this year I wanted to bang out as many games as possible, so I decided to tackle a bunch of trilogies. And I uh, love my Vita, and I figured let's play some God of War. Let's see what the fuss is about. Oh man, he's angry. Oh God, he's bashing a guy's head in for no reason. Oh geez, he just used. He's bald. Yeah, <laughs> he's Greek. <laughs> <laughs> He's using a, a, a live woman as a door wedge to hold the door open. To hold the door? Hold door? Yeah, hold the hold door. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> he is literally causing Ragnarok in Greece. Nice, nice. All right, so would you recommend people go back and give the ones on uh, the Vita a chance? Uh, yeah, they're like I said, they're short. They're not hard. You know, they're easy to come by. You can even get them on the PlayStation 3 pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Uh I, I, I was making fun of it, but they are, like, fun games. They're actually, they're not particularly hard. They're nice, relaxing games, believe it or not, even though it's a lot of epic music and angry yelling. And baldness. It, yes, lots of baldness. <laughs> so would you say these games are polished to a sheen? M middle aged dads, uh, stay away. Oh, man, I still got my full head of hair, but... <laughs> it was... It was fun to play on my couch while I listened to podcasts and YouTube videos. Okay. There were some parts I didn't like. I really didn't like this one part uh, towards the middle of the first game where you're in this sandy desert and you have to find these three sirens. And your only key to finding them is you, you slowly hear them singing the closer you get to them. Otherwise, you can't see them, and it's a big open area, and you can't pan your camera around. You just have to follow their noise, and there's three of them. And if you mess up and you get killed, uh, guess what? You're starting over again. I think I spent like an hour the first time I tried doing it, just doing that part. Ugh. It has, like, it has, it's weird because the first game at, at least has a lot of spots where you, where you, where you can kind of breeze past and then you hit this one really annoying thing and you're stuck on that for a really long time i didn't encounter any of that in the second or third game i don't i don't believe i just kind of breezed right through i did have a little trouble uh keeping track of some of the puzzles because a lot of it was you go you turn a corner you do something in this big area for a while then you return to this main middle area and then you go off to another area and you do something there for a while then you return to the middle area again and then you do something else so it was actually really hard for me to keep track of where i had gone and where i hadn't gone but ultimately it was fun all right all right i think we're ready for blue star your next game uh, so my next game is going to be one that I also spent way too much time on over the summer. Um, I also I, I also don't really know what compelled me to play Diablo 3 over the summer. Um, this is one that I actually started playing originally when it came out, which has got to be like almost 10 years ago now because I'm old. Um, <laughs> I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> God, I feel ancient. Uh, so I played it 10 years or so ago with my parents and my brother. It was kind of our go-to couch co-op game. So I think we bought it and we broke it out on a, like a New Year's Eve and we just played for, I don't know, probably five hours or so that day. Um, and we did beat it as the four of us. And it was kind of the most recent in a, a, a little string of dungeon crawlers like that that we would play as a family. I think the ones before that were the Champions of Norath games that were on the PS2, if anybody has heard of those. Um, so I've had the game on, you know, PlayStation 3. I have it on PlayStation 4. I have all the different versions of it because they came out with extra DLC later. Um, and the game has 
honestly evolved a lot since it came out in the last ten in the last ten years. And a lot of Diablo fans will like play all the different seasons and things like that. And there's a lot of different mechanics. And while I was playing it, I actually had a friend ask me if I was making a seasonal character, and I'm like, no, what's that? I'm gonna just play the adventure story over and over again and keep reloading and exploring areas to find all of the uh, random dungeons and lore books and kill every type of rare monster. Uh, so I got the Platinum Trophy over the summer. It took me probably close to 100 hours. By the end of the time, by the end of the time, I was so ready to be done. I was like, please <laughs> save me from this. Uh, but with playing it that much, um, I definitely did have a good time and you know, I beat the game with all six classes and got to max level and found all the random stuff. And if you've played Diablo 3, you know that there's there's a lot of randomization to the areas and the maps that you get to play. So it took a very long time, but it was just fun. The, just the one you had to do the auto battle like overnight? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes. Was it like 10,000 souls or something like that? I had, or? To, I had to kill 10,000 demons as a demon hunter. And there's there's one quest where there's a demon who off screen summons a bunch and they just sort of come at you. So I equipped a bunch of thorns damage equipment. So when they would basically spike armor on steroids, so they'd basically come and spear themselves on me. And I'd leave that going overnight. And so for like eight hours or so while I was sleeping, I would get mm, like 3,000 demons killed. So like, there's no way anybody would be able to kill that many, like, actually in the game. Like, I don't know how... Because most of the monsters you fight are not demons, so those would not count for that quest. So, uh, yeah, I'm very glad that I... Uh, found that exploit <laughs> <laughs> so is there is diablo 4 coming out soon is that diablo 4 is coming out soon i don't know a hundred percent if i'm interested in it I, I believe it's next year um and so a couple of reasons for that are you know one i don't i refer Blizzard. to diablo 3 yeah i refer to diablo That's 3 why. as my emotional support dungeon crawler so i don't know how i'm gonna do if that changes i don't know if i'm gonna like it as much also hearing everything that's going on with diablo immortal i'm just kind of like mm, i'm good we'll see maybe in like you know another 10 years i'll pick it up and you'll ps6 it to death yeah gonna try to get the platinum in uh that Diablo 2 remaster or whatever? I have not looked into getting or playing Diablo 2 anywhere in the near future. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I never played the original either. That was before my time because while I'm old, I'm not that old. Uh, so, maybe we'll get there. I have a backlog of enough stuff and, you know, 40 more hours to put into Dragon Quest Treasures. <laughs> And that's where you get the to the credits. <laughs> <laughs> She's still not to the credits yet. Very true. All right. So anything else, Diablo, you want to talk about? Are we good? No, I think we're good. Okay. Well, then I will go into what dragged me away from Dragon Quest Treasures, but also kept pulling at me earlier this year. Um, Pokemon that had two major releases this year. Uh, right, I think it was at the end of January, we got Pokemon Arceus. And then at the end of November, we got Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. And I have played all the Pokemon games through the years. I've done a lot of side content. Sword and Shield was probably the first game in about 10 years that I didn't get at launch. I waited a full year for it. Um, and it was mainly like my son was started to show interest in playing more role playing games. Um, as he wrote in his journal at school recently, like, I really like the games that my dad plays. I want to play more games like my dad. And like two Aww. years ago, I know I, my That's wife was so like, Hey, sweet. did you see this? <laughs> Cause she usually goes through his stuff and signs everything on the weekends and kind of looks through it. She's like, did you see this page? And I was like, Oh, um, but he had been showing more interest in it and tried sun and moon two years ago in the summer since we we're on lockdown. I was like, we're, we're going to try everything. And that year we started doing a lot of co-op games together and he tried Pokemon moon. And I think there was a one point where he leaned on the power button on the 3ds wrong and lost like two and a half hours of progress. 
and was done. Like, no, I'm done. Yep, so, that'll uh, do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So finally, I got it. I, I decided to. We, we did uh, Sword and Shield together in uh, 2020. Bought it the same day and started playing. And he he ended up putting like 200 hours in that game throughout the last two years. So um, very. He's been very excited to get Arceus. Very excited to get Violet. Um, and he discovered YouTube earlier this year. So it was very. He was able to look up like where I need to go on Arceus. What I need to do. Where can I? How do I go shiny hunting and all that? So. Um, he's had a blast with both of them. I, I think I've liked Violet more than him. He's liked Arceus more than me. Um, but at the same time, like we bought Arceus and I got like five weeks early, the review code for Rune Factory 5. So I was like, oh my God, I can't put so much time into Arceus. I got to do this. So we're playing it kind of asynchronous, asynchronously, but uh, I just love the open world nature of both of these. Uh, I mean, Arceus isn't fully open world. It's like 90%. It's like treasures. You know what? You got to load to go to an area, but then that area is gigantic and it's, you know, open for the next 45 minutes. So you're just walking around, going all over the place. I love the catching mechanics in that, that you didn't always have to battle. Um, uh, one of the things I loved was the freaking sound for the shinies. Like, I'm just walking around and I hear that little sound and I'm like, oh shit, there's a shiny around here. Um, I loved that. Uh, the story was actually kind of interesting i was like oh you know it wasn't exactly what you thought it was it wasn't really what going into the past it was some sort of kind of kind of but kind of some alternate realities some stuff too um i I didn't really get all that but it was uh it it was neat it was kind of cool going through that uh especially since i kind of felt like burned by the diamond and pearl remakes just a couple months earlier they were kind of like meh this is pokemon i've already played i'm i think i'm done with that kind of pokemon um, but Arceus, the open world was awesome. The catching. I actually just really like going and doing side quests. And then, you know, let me go talk to this guy. Oh, he's got a side quest. What do I need to do? Where do I need to go? Let's go there. Cool. Um, not something that happens in a lot of Pokemon games. And then Violet, uh, I got right before I got treasures. And, like, I sped through treasures, I swear, just to get the review done. But also, like, right back to Violet. And, heck, three minutes ago, as right before I was about to start talking here, I did my first six-star raid. Um... I kind of forgot. I think Lou, I was talking to you like, oh, what other Diablo thing? And I was like, oh, crap, this battle started like a minute ago and I haven't done anything for my team. Um, I, I, I beat the story of Violet pretty quickly and was like, ah, you know, that's what I usually do in Pokemon 20, 30 hours and then done. But there are 400 Pokemon in here. I think my Pokedex is almost up to 350 at this point. Um, that is definitely a higher percentage than I have done in any mainline Pokemon game. in I think since Fire Red and Leaf Green. <laughs> So I, I'm really enjoying it. I love the open world. The glitches have been manageable. Nothing's crashed. I mean, shit, I played games back on my Game Boy and whatever. So, you know, bad graphics and glitches. I've lived through them for many a year myself. So but, but I feel like the farther I've gone, the less glitches I've seen. Either that or they just fade in the background, whatever. I know not to get in a battle on a hill if I don't want to see through the hill the entire battle or, you know, have fight the battle while I'm staring at grass and nothing else on the screen. Um, <laughs> I, I found a nice place to eat a ham sandwich at my picnic and spawn myself like a shitload of chances and level up 30 levels in less than an hour. I got completely addicted in the post game to just doing the terror raids over and over and over again. Um, I had listened to a podcast, the super effective um, Pokemon podcast I've listened to off and on. And I listened to strategies before the, uh, what is it? One of the Charizard weeks weekends came about and the guy was talking all about, it. he's like, ah, everybody uses the fricking Azrumeril. What is it? Cuts his life in half to greatly increase his attack power, belly something. And then, you know, just big blast, moon blast or water attacks. He goes, everybody brings these fricking Pokemon in. He's like, let me tell you a couple other Pokemons. He goes, first of all, nobody online is the white mage. Nobody, nobody does uh, healing. Nobody does what everybody just joins these raids and goes full on. Well, I I followed his advice and built myself a Grim Snarl up to uh, level 100, and I got Light Screen on him, I got Taunt on him, and I just go into all these terror raids, and I taunt, I put up a Light Screen, and then I'm just like the tank while everybody else is attacking and cutting their health in half to do big hits. I'm just like, bring it, and I just keep healing us, and at least the few times that I can, and uh, I I breeze through, you had to do like 10 or 12, something like that five-star raids before you can open up six-star raids and got a couple six-star raids done in just the past two hours once i finally opened that up but i I, 
the other night we had friends over and I, I was just exhausted by the time they left at nine. I fell asleep at nine and woke wide up at 1 a.m. And from like 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. I was just doing terror raids for four hours. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? But <laughs> <laughs> but it's really fun. And I was like, I was recognizing enough shadows of Pokemon's that I didn't have. So I think in those like five hours, I got like 25 more added to the Pokedex. And a lot of those were like ones that were in the other version or, oh God, I'm going to have to walk this fucking Pokemon 100 steps alongside me to evolve it. And like, no, I don't now. I just found one in a Terror Raid. And for, you know, all, all those ones that have those really weird evolutions, I was been picking up a lot of them. So it, it's been fun. And I'm like, man, I, trading with my son and playing with my son with the online connectivity that you can do at the same times. We did find out a little disappointingly today that I couldn't help him through five-star raids. He's not quite the level that he needs to be for those. Um, but because I just rely on everybody else to do damage, I'm just the white mage. And do, doing a raid battle with him, if you're like connected together and you try to do a raid, you just get two computer helpers. You can't go online and have everybody help at the same time. So it, with two computer helpers and him not able to really do much damage, it was like, yeah, we're going to fail all these. So. Whatever, but he was excited right before bed tonight. He was he finished a couple five star raids on his own, so I guess he's getting better. Take a look at that and Point get of going with that. Point information: You said mm -hmm. you found a spot at a picnic to sit down and eat your ham sandwich. Was that yes. an in-game picnic and ham sandwich, or a real life <laughs> picnic and ham sandwich? It's an in-game one because apparent. So what is it? The last game, Sword and Shield. You could have the little. You could set up a tent with your Pokemon oh, yes, and make camping. curry. Okay. Yeah, the camping. This time it's picnicking. And okay. Th apparently, you know, the Spain region is known for sandwiches, right? Everybody knows Spain sandwich. That's, that's what Spain's known for. But that's what they did this time. You know, you set up a picnic and you can make sandwiches and the sandwiches can either, uh, I think they all have like three powers. They can increase a power for... I'm going to screw one of these up. I think this is one I don't really know much about. They, one of the powers for each sandwich is like to increase the power of some Pokemon, like psychic power. One is to increase the presence of certain types. So eating a ham sandwich increases the the normal types in your area. So if you go to where Chansey's spawn and you eat a ham sandwich, suddenly it's just, you know, there's like seven Chanseys on screen. Just like and real life. Just gotcha. like real life. It's, yeah. Yeah. It becomes a uh, an experience bloodbath around there, and also the um, it does egg powers or egg something too, because the way you get eggs in this game is you have picnics, <laughs> and with the Pokemon in your party. And I don't know, I haven't done a single one, but you have my no son idea has where this egg came from. Oh no! And apparently, if you're like, especially if you're eating certain sandwiches to increase rates, like my son found five eggs in the basket. <laughs> So he, he decided to just keep doing that over and over again. He is obsessed with getting um, one of the one of the main things in the game is pigs. Um, there's these little pigs in the game that are, you know, they're the they're the frickin' ratatas of the game. Uh, but he wants to get a shiny one. So he has decided that he will just keep eating the same sandwich that he has discovered that lets him get like five eggs at a time every time he has a picnic. And he just keeps opening the eggs and wonder trading them away and or surprise trading or whatever it's called these days. But apparently after the two Charizard weekends, I guess the, there's a lot of people out there trying to get themselves a shiny Charizard through eggs. And even I've gotten two Charmanders level one through just mm -hmm. wonder trading. I'm just throwing it out there and I'm like, what the frick? There's my son has like seven of them at this point from all the pigs he trades away. He's like, oh, daddy, I got like seven Charmanders. So I'm like, yeah, we never got to the seven star raid and Blaziken's coming next. But whatever, we got Charmelia or Charmander. We'll just raise him up to be one. whoop de doo But I, I've just really enjoyed both games. I, I think they both added something. Arceus, uh, you know, dipped the toe into the open world and made it so that battles aren't, you know, the main part of everything. You really could just run around and catch damn near everything without having a single freaking battle. Um, and I really like the side quest system. It was fun, kind of like Dragon Quest Treasures, you know, just so many things to do. And then Scarlet and Violet have just, you know, taken the basic idea of, oh, you know, you want to be an adventurer, go defeat the eight gyms. Well, this time you got eight gyms to do. Great, but that's not part of the, that's not the whole story. There's these five Titan Pokemons and there's a whole storyline about that. Go catch the five titans and there's a guy that joins you on all of them they're all these big double battles and then there's five team star battles so you can go do five team star battles 
And so there's like 18 things to do. It, 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 and then all three of those storylines converge at the end. Um, and, and it's a really kind of personal story at the end. It's, you know, yeah, you got to do the frickin' JRPG, save the world kind of thing. But it, it, they, the way they do it, the way they set it up, it's like really character driven. It's not like the other Pokemon games where, oh man, I got to get more land. So I got to dry up the water. We're going to use a laser and dry up the fucking water and make the whole world land. That'll solve our problems or whatever. It was a very character driven. There's a personal story there and you need to solve it at the end. And, eh, you know, the benefit is it helps the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a so, bad Pokemon fan, and I haven't played either of the, these games, and uh, I don't have any plans to get them anytime uh, soon. I'm a horrible fan. I talked about it on the games we're look. I talked about Arceus on the games we're looking forward to in 2022 episode, and then I just didn't get it. <laughs> yeah, I have both games. Uh, I tried playing Arceus. The gameplay is fun. Uh, it is ugly. Uh, I'm not Mr. Uh, High Fidelity. Yeah. Great great graphics but like art, art design is important and the game is ugly and you know i guess i have kind of it feels washed out light wise like, yes it's kind of dull you're in a I dull world i also have a very controversial opinion that frankly i don't really care if pokemon ever became an open world franchise everyone's always like <gasps> oh pe people always go oh pokemon needs to be an open world series i'm like does it does it though i don't know uh I, I, yeah, I, I feel like not necessarily everything needs to be open world. I am glad that people are having fun with these new ones, even with all the glitches, though. Mm -hmm. I also got Scarlet, but I, uh, Scar yeah, Scarlet. I got Scarlet, but I decided I was going to wait to see if they did anything about the glitches <laughs> <laughs> in performance. Again, not something I normally care about, but I was kind of losing my mind when I was maybe 20 minutes into the game, and... I could already see through a tree while my, a, <laughs> while a Pokeball was shaking, like trying to catch a Pokemon. And I can see the little Fido behind a tree. And I was like, okay, this is going to be a problem. Or um, He keeps saying he doesn't actually care about these things, but <laughs> if he keeps bringing it up, you know he's really a snob. There, there's, there, there is a point. <laughs> there is a point where you got to be like, okay, maybe this could have used a little bit more time in the oven. Oh, yeah, it definitely could. But, you know, you, in the middle. you got a but you got 17,000 million Quaxley plushes sitting around. You better pump the game out to sell yeah, them. Exactly. <laughs> got a new season of anime. Got to get rid of Ash. You know? Oh, yes. <laughs> Burn that fucker down. Get rid of Ash. Just like Mario. Fuck Mario. Fuck Ash. <laughs> I, I think yeah, I just hear you say "fuck Mario." Uh, <laughs> oh, I said that on the last episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, you haven't listened to our part one. I so. don't actually. I don't really have a, listen to any of the episodes. Of that's all film. right. That's all right. That's all right. But no, I, Yangus and I have actually have an episode. Um, Wait, so do you listen to episodes that you are in? I don't like listening to the sound of my own voice. So. <laughs> <laughs> Same. As soon as an episode I'm on is uh, on my podcast feed, I'm gonna delete. No. <laughs> Swipe uh, on that one. Let's get rid of that. See, one. I have to hit play and just turn the volume down because I want my statistics on my podcast catcher to show that I listened to it. I was like, well, I listened to it. I was on it. <laughs> yeah, true. But no, I, I, I don't really listen to our podcast all the way through afterwards. If it's one I'm not on, like when Yangus and uh, Brewery and talked, uh, what is it, Dungeon Encounters? I did. That was fun. But all right. Well, I, I think that's enough uh, Pokemon encounter. So, Evan, back to you for. Uh, all right. Know, your next trilogy. All right, this isn't a trilogy. It's more of a quadrilogy. Uh, I played the Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm games. I don't know why. I remember many years ago I had decided to uh, marathon the manga. Uh, I had read chunks of the manga and watched chunks of the anime when I was young, but I never read it the whole way through front to back. So I spent literally two months reading 72 volumes of Naruto. And I was, I guess I was kind of like in a, a high and decided to just buy the games for the PlayStation 4 because they had a trilogy uh, collection uh, while they were on sale. And I played the first game uh, many years ago. And I was like, this is dog shit and dropped it. <laughs> But I was like, all right, I, I was I was planning on this is no longer the case, but I was planning on like boxing away my PlayStation 4 to make room for the PlayStation 5 that I don't have yet. Um, so I was going through PlayStation 4 games. I was like, you know what? Let's bang out these. 
Naruto games. And the first game is still dog shit, but once you play it for a bit, you kind of get into it. So basically, um, it recounts the first 27 or so volumes of the story. It's the entire Naruto section pre-Shippuden, um, but it, it tells it in the worst possible way. There's like six cutscenes across the entire game. Many of them are not plot relevant to what happens in the story. And most of the plot is told uh, when you go into a mission and you see like a description of what's happening in the story and then you fight and then uh, I think there's like another description of what happened afterwards and then that's it. And I was, I was like, this is like the worst way a person can possibly experience this story no one know, would know what the hell is going on but anyways the game it's like a it's a arena battler um what i do like about the games is that it makes uh fighting game dummies feel like we're doing lots of cool stuff by pressing a minimal number of buttons um the, i would say the first game is actually probably one of the harder games because it's, it's a lot more stiff than um some of the later games some of the heavier characters move really badly and Towards the back of the game, you're fighting really fast characters, so it was incredibly frustrating doing the story mode while playing as very slow characters against very fast characters. The gameplay wasn't really perfected just yet, it felt very clunky, but as it got along, it became a lot more or smooth and fluid. I felt like I was getting better as I played them too. I was doing better at um, dodging, blocking. Um, you can do, uh, you can, you can do. Uh, transportation jutsus that help you like go from one part to one side of the other you know you can block someone appear behind them and attack them there i was doing better at stuff like that um but the way they t it's every game does it a little bit differently but this one had a oh, the first one had like an at a mini open world it was basically the the the, te the, the leaf village and you can roam around and the way the story is told is you do side quests you get points score enough points you unlock more story missions do more story missions you get points you unlock more side quests you um it's on and on rinse repeat and then you know you, you do some side stuff in the open world collect some stuff buy some stuff uh those count as missions too uh i got mission points whatever they're called i don't remember um from playing the game for a certain length of time and then uh, i wanted to play the game just enough to get the trophy the platinum trophy it's a very easy platinum trophy it's pretty much just collect half of everything in the game basically and spend x number of hours playing the game and so after i finished with that i went on to uh, the second game um it has a much larger and in my opinion, a much worse open worlds. They tried to make it more interesting by letting you travel from place to place. Um, it made the game a lot slower and more dull because a lot of it was going from one field to another field to another field to another village, which doesn't have much in it. It was very boring. Uh, the gameplay was a lot better, I would say. Um, I kind of wanted to rush through it though because I think I was like about to go on vacation. So I was like, all right, let's just bash out this second game. When I come back from my vacation, I'll play through the third game. And so I kind of went right through it in as quickly as possible, barely touched the side quests at all. Um, I decided not to go for the platinum in this one because if I remember correctly, there was a glitch trophy that you wouldn't really know about until you got towards the very end of the game and you did all this other stuff. And then another trophy that was like, collect all the titles. And to do that, you had to play as all 40 plus characters 30 times. It's like, I'm not messing with any of that. So then after I came back, I played the third game and this game was completely different from the second game in that they have an open world, but you don't really mess with it until after the game. And the whole game is told entirely through cutscenes. I think more than half the game is a cutscene. Um, I actually did the math. There was one cutscene that went for 40 minutes straight, nonstop, just a cutscene. I was blown away. I was like eating my dinner while this cutscene was playing in my, in this game. Um, I do think it's my favorite of the of them though. Uh, it had the tightest gameplay. I thought the trophy, the platinum trophy, was pretty fair. It was doing certain cut. It was doing certain side quests and collecting certain things. It's a very quick platinum trophy, so I went for that one too. 
Um, an important thing to note about this one and the second game I forgot to mention is that they lock an incredibly story important scene in a hidden boss fight that you have to do certain side quests for. And if you don't do them, you miss incredibly important details about the game and the story. If you do not do them, you'll be very confused if you jump from three immediately into four why certain characters are in certain areas and certain characters aren't villains anymore. It's very crazy. Um, I also would like to say the full game, it, the third game's full title is Naruto Shippuden Ultimate Ninja Storm 3. And I played the full burst edition and it has six different fonts in its title. They all, they're all different fonts and they're all different colors. It's a mess. I, I, you should look it up. It's hilarious. But then I go on to the fourth game, and this one is also completely different in how it does its story. This time they were just like, fuck open world. It's just a, it's a chapter select now. Because the fourth game is told entirely in one area for the most part. They're like, it's not messing with an open world. I heard there's an open world in the post game. I didn't play it. Um, so you just go chapter, fight a boss, cutscenes fight a boss, cutscene, you know, you just go through it real quick. I think it only took me four to five hours to play through that game, whereas the other ones took around, geez, uh, 20, 30 hours between them. I think between all four games, it, it took me about 80 hours. So it was a pretty good balance in terms of length of time you spend playing them. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is they're somewhat famous for their boss fights, which are incredibly well well performed, very fun, very very hype. Lots of hype, lots of explosions, epic music, uh, cool stuff happening on screen. Um, usually, when you do a phase, this cutscene starts playing, and you have to start hitting buttons like it's a, a quick time event to do cool stuff. Lots of things blowing up, characters doing cool moves. Like the like the best part about all the games. For the most part, are these boss battles? So like, even if you don't even play them, uh, I I would recommend people who are like kind of interested just look up you know b the boss battles, just see how like ridiculously like lavish they are. But yes, uh, I really enjoyed playing those games. Um, it was actually kind of like an emotional experience because I got to play through Naruto all over again. Like it's, I always thought Naruto was kind of bad, but it's like kind of one of those things from my childhood where it's like, oh, it's getting me in the feels, even though I know this is kind of shitty and I can't stand another 10 minute monologue from Sasuke about the darkness consuming him. And Naruto talking about how they're best friends and he wants to save him. And Sakura standing in a corner not doing anything. But yes, highly recommend. It's a very fun game. If you are a fighting game baby like me, it is very easy to play. Uh, and you get to, and it makes you feel really awesome uh, in the combat. So 10 out of 10 would recommend. All right, I have a question for you here because I've actually wrote this down since you had mentioned uh, this is a good game for the fighting game babies because you can just press the buttons. Yes. Um, I, I want to know which button you press the most. Oh, God. Was, wait, wait. Was it the half hexagon on the top, the flat oval over to the right, the cross at the bottom, or the sideways diamond? <laughs> <laughs> I, I played this like 10 months ago. I don't remember any of the buttons at all. I know one of them was like, this one's the dash. This one is your heavy. This one's your light. This one is to block. This one charges your chakra. Press the charge button and then press this button to do a cool thing. Um, press this button at the right time to uh, teleport. Stuff like that. I don't remember any of the buttons, to be honest. Just just, just making fun of your use of the cross. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> With our uh, flat oval <laughs> button. <laughs> Hey, it's a Japanese game. A lot of those games, you got to hit the uh, circle button quite a bit more. Yeah. They, they, they <laughs> like their circle button instead of a... I, I play a lot of my Vita, too, so <laughs> that goes a lot through. All right, Blue Star, you've got one more game that I know you wanted to talk about. I get some tales about game. this. Uh, I do have some tales about this, although I don't have any notes because I didn't know what to write. So we're going to wing this. Um, All right. This is, a, <laughs> this is a game that I've actually <laughs> talked about on the podcast before. It was almost two years ago now, which also makes me feel old. How many times can I say I feel old in one podcast? Well, we're about to find out. Um, 
So it was on the games we are looking forward to for 2021 episode, and I talked mm. about the upcoming release of Tales of Arise. Now, it took me a little bit in order to get my hands on this, and I actually got it for Christmas after it came out, I want to say in September-ish. I think you're right, um, yeah. And it actually won Game of the Year. Or, not Game yeah. of the Year. It won RPG of the RPG. Year. RPG. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was very proud of myself for kind of calling that. Uh, also, I talked about Kirby and the Forgotten World on the games we're looking forward to in 2022 episode, and that won Family Game of the Year. So I'm just on a and, roll, man. Oh, I was going to say, you talked It Takes Two, right? Yes, It Takes Two oh, and geez. Tales of Arise were both of my, were both mine on uh, the 2021 episode. So I got, so I got a streak going. Pay attention next month to what Blue's looking forward to. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure. <laughs> like, oh yeah, my favorite game was God of War, Ragnarok, and Elden Ring. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of which are games that I've played because I'm not a huge action RPG fan. However, the Tales series is one that I make an exception for. Um, so I got into the series, I've talked about this on the podcast before, I was in a GameStop looking at, you know, used PS3 games on the shelf, picked one up, Tales of Graces F, looked at the back and it said it was one to four players I'm like hmm, co-op game I can play it with my brother uh, brought it home had an absolute blast he says you know we, we played Tales of Graces first and we've been searching for that high ever since and let me tell you Tales of Arise comes very very close um, so the Tales series has had kind of a weird little slump with the release of Zestiria and Berseria And most of that is because their gameplay systems changed a little bit to focus a lot on customization of equipment and, you know, like random skill combinations on equipment and things like that. And it ended up with the games getting really unnecessarily difficult because, like, rather than just being able to build powerful characters, you have to be like, okay, I'm fighting a dragon boss now, so I need to go find equipment with the dragon killer skill on it and it just it takes forever for the amount of uh you know versatility that they want you to have in your equips you do not have nearly the drop rate that you need in order to actually make it efficient so those those two games while the story and the world are very cool and the characters are fun the gameplay is a little bit of a slot Tales of Arise goes back a little bit to some of the systems that were that, that a lot of fans really like about the older Tales games. Um, so equipment is a lot more simple. Um, the only thing that's really customizable is your accessories, and there's not a ton there. And it's one of those things that you can get into it and completely min-max it, or you can completely ignore it, and you'll still be able to beat the game totally fine. Um, the combat is a little bit different than from all of the other games in that it's like very heavy action RPG. It's not uh, line movement like all of the other ones have been. And combat, it's so buttery smooth. Um, it's it's so smooth to go from you know attacking into uh, an art which is like a special attack and moving into something else. And you can call in your party members to do specific things. So you'll have one character who can knock birds out of the sky. You'll have another one who can just stop enemies from casting spells. Um, and so you can just switch between all of that on the fly. And it's 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 really smooth to play and it's really enjoyable. And it's the battle system is so good and so fluid and it kind of requires the camera to be fixed on the player with how fast everything is going which is brings me to the one thing that m- sort of annoys me about Tales of Arise is that it's the first game in the Tales series that is actually not one to four players um, you still have four people on the battlefield but it is only one player which was a bummer for my brother and I um, but we were still able to, you know, enjoy the story together, pass the controller off. I think there were some times that he was at school where I would just run around, do side quests, collect materials to make the new equipment that we needed, um, and that sort of thing. So I had a lot of fun with it. Um, the story is great, the characters are great, I love them a lot. 
uh, and it's it's definitely a really enjoyable one. So I guess I can do a little synopsis of the story now that I've talked all the mechanics, doing this a little out of order. Um, so basically, you start the game and you're basically a slave in a desert town, and you have a iron helmet stuck on your head. And I guess you were found by the people in the in this slave camp and help, and you don't remember anything. So they all call you Iron Mask because the doctor who found you didn't want to start calling you something else because you had your own identity somewhere. Um, so you get to be Iron Mask and you don't remember anything and you can't feel pain. So, you know, you'll be taking hits for other people and you just you just don't feel it. You still get hurt, but there's, there's no reaction to like pull away from it or try to avoid it. Um, and then comes in this girl from the race that is sort of the slave drivers. Um, and she is coming in to look for something. And she has a curse that is called thorns. And basically anybody that touches her gets electrocuted. So you have this guy who can't feel pain and this girl who electrocutes anybody she touches. And, you know, they kind of <laughs> have a little connection there just because they're both, like, like she's like, he's the first one who can actually touch me without recoiling. So the, the two of them go on an adventure, meet a bunch of others, and the whole idea is to liberate this slave planet. The, whole, the entire planet is basically enslaved by this uh, sort of superior race from the other planet. And you go around and liberate the world. And there's different, uh, different areas, different. each has a different element. And it's just a really cool, really vibrant, every area is different, so highly, <laughs> highly recommend. It's a it's a very good time. I mean, it did win uh, RPG of the Year it last year, It did win right? RPG of the Year, and it was very <laughs> well deserved. Yeah, I heard a lot of people that, um, you know, writing for RP Gamer, I see all the chat about these kind of things, and yeah, a lot of people that had kind of fallen off was like, wow, that was really great. Like, I, I think exactly what you said. You know, a lot of people that were like, eh, you know... The series is kind of flagging a bit and yeah, just got they, them back. They definitely brought it back to a lot of the older things that made the series, you know, what it was. And it was very apparent that that's what they were doing. Um, so I think a lot of fans really appreciated that. Um, they also were planning to release it for their, I believe it was the series 20th anniversary, which I believe would have been in 2019. Uh I did not do my research before this, but it was some, something around there, and the game actually got delayed uh, due to COVID. So I guess it would have released in 2020. Um, so they, they delayed it so that it didn't release in their anniversary year, or their big anniversary year. You have an anniversary every year, don't you? Uh, Usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... so talking about you know how maybe pokemon scarlet and violet could have had a little more time in the oven this is one that they gave a little more time in the oven and it definitely paid off nice i i was um listening to another podcast about this at some point and was, they used to have two teams working together on the tales of games like every other tales of game would be a different team i yeah. know nothing about that oh, okay I thought I heard that and that this was more of a combination because it was like supposed to be for the big anniversary. It was they got everybody working on this and huh. maybe that's why it was so good. It was, you know, a lot of ideas that came together. What probably got out of its slump was it stopped using fake words and in Sia, like Zestiria, <laughs> Berseria, Symphonia. Zillia. Yeah, yeah, that that hey, could have Symphonia been the difference too. Symphonia and Vesperia too. are good though, so. All right, um... I'm going to talk uh, my last game here, and then we'll uh, round it up. Uh, when I got back from vacation this summer, I, I don't know why, but I got uh, after Persona 3, I was looking for a lot of short games. And also I was like, oh, let me knock a couple things off my list. And one of the first things I did was uh, goddamn Puzzles and Dragons Mario Brothers. I had <laughs> picked that up. Uh, yeah, I, I, I had picked that up a long time ago. I think my son, maybe like three years ago, was trying to play Puzzles and Dragons on the iPad. And I was like, oh, I think they actually came out with like a real version of this. You didn't have to, you know, no mobile crap or whatever. And I was like, oh, yeah, the Mario Brothers edition. Um, I, I think I picked it up for like eight or nine dollars at that point. And I, I'd started it and I was like, oh, this is pretty fun. I, I love puzzle matching games and having an RPG behind it. Awesome. Also, Puzzle Quest 3 came out this year. It was a con 
complete piece of mobile garbage that I didn't want to touch more than like two hours of. I was like, no. So being disappointed by one, I put a lot of time into Puzzles and Dragons and God damn what that game. It, it was kind of fun, but it was a huge grind. And after like 10 hours, it became evident that you had to do just a certain way to play if you wanted to try to get through the game without grinding like incredible levels. So I bared down. I did it. And finally, 28 hours later, I beat it. But I, I was like, man, I really wish there was like a good puzzle RPG instead of going back to the original puzzle quests. So I started Googling it and I found Might and Magic Clash of Heroes. Um, saw a lot of 9 out of 10 reviews, a couple clickbait articles about like the best puzzle games, puzzle RPGs ever. And it was on like three different lists. Like these three lists had no games in common, but like except for this one. And I'm like, well, damn, I'll try that on the DS. Um, it's also available on PC, Xbox, PS3, and all over the place on mobile too um but it launched in 2009 on the ds and the story starts off like a, a lot of rpgs you know whatever you're just in an idyllic forest blah 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 blah. you're getting together to you know all the all these kind of maybe teenage early 20s kids are getting together with their parents they're different races they're gonna form a peace treaty or whatever and then bam man it just blows up demons are there and undead whatever pretty much all the old people get killed and the kids off to run back to their kingdoms and there's all this like oh did the humans attack the or uh, elves or did this happen whatever and i like the narrative version um it took me a while to realize like wow this is just right on the game cover the game cover has five different people on it and you end up playing as all five people um and each one has uh, like a six to eight hour story arc to go through and it half plays um it is Might and Magic, Clash of Heroes. It plays a little bit overworld, like a Heroes of Might and Magic game where you're just going from like point to point on a map um, and you can go down different paths or whatever. And on those, uh, you can open different places. You can unlock different units because you'll want to unlock some better units. The very beginning of each story, you have like uh, two or three different little guys that take up one square. And they may be little archers, they may be little shield guides, they may be little goblins that have a just a small spear. But you, when you first start a new level and you're or a new like a new world, a new campaign, and you're playing as uh, one of these heirs of the people that got killed or whatnot, it, it's all like kind of a match three. But what's cool is it splits with, with the DS version at least. You you split the enemies have their matches on the top, you have your matches on the bottom. And you're trying to match, if you get three people matched vertically, um, they have like a attack counter, like, oh, we're gonna, all three of us are all getting ready and we're gonna march forward into the enemy in two turns and they'll have a little counter on them. If you match three people color-wise, at least um, horizontally, they disappear and form a wall to help block enemy attacks. And so you're really trying to get a lot of vertical things launching so that it goes up. And when they go up, they attack whoever's in their way. And if they can do enough damage to get through whoever's in their way, then they go to the back line and attack um, whatever hero of the other army you're attacking. And they have, they've got some cool ones where like, there's a big frickin' tree growing in the middle and you can only attack in the middle and do that. Or there were some where like, you're fighting two big knights and they're only at specific places on the battlefield. So you've got six columns of enemies or six columns of your little guys there. And only a couple other columns will be where you need to hit. So you're trying to build walls and the other ones just so they won't come down and hit your hero. And there's a charge meter and your hero gets to do um, some cool attacks. It starts off with, I think, the first level or the first kind of story beat, you're an elf and you're going through trying to convince the elves that, like, no, I was there. The humans did not attack us and kill us, um, blow up the peace treaty. It was these bad guys, these imps or necromancer people or whatever. And then the second story beat, you're a necromancer at some point and going through the underworld and kind of taking place. And you, you get a preview of the end of other people's chapters sometimes, because I think in the necromancer level, right near the end, you see one of the other people pop through. And I don't. And when you go through their storyline later, you are there in the necromancer land. Um, I think the third level was the human knight. And after the first 
level ones. I was like, this is really cool. Then I got to the human knights, and I'm like, these guys are boring. The units were all very cumbersome. They didn't do a lot of damage. Um, the, the, I think the first two times, it was really advantageous to set up walls because they really stopped a lot of damage. And then the humans were like really sucked at making walls. And instead of your uh, hero's main like charge up attack being an attack, it was like, cool, I can make more walls. And I was like, well, this fucking sucks because the humans are not as good as the elves and the necromancers or the wizards or the demon people. So whatever, I, I powered through that one. Um, but it, it was just like a really fun match three game. Uh, I want to say I beat it in under 30 hours. So, you know, the five things about six hours each maybe 30 to 40, and I, I was just captivated by this. And I swear I'd never heard of it, and ever since I've said that, I hear people talk about it off and on all the time. I was listening to a podcast that I listen to every week, and um, at the end, they're always like, oh, so what are we going to play this week? And one of the girls is like, man, she goes, I don't know, like, something's just calling me to just go download uh, the, the Clash of Heroes from Fighting Magic again and play that. I was like, oh, damn, there it is again. Just randomly hearing people talk about it, this 13-year-old game. So they never made another one. I've checked out the developer that was hired to do it, and they've kind of done some other, not exactly match three kind of puzzle things, but I uh, can't remember who the developer is right off the top of my head. I had it at some point, but um, they were all agree here. Oh, Capybara Games. Uh, never really heard of them, but yeah, they've done some puzzle games, mobile and other stuff in since then. So fun little game that I just kind of ex unexpectedly came out of nowhere. I think Brurian talked about it at some point with me, not on the podcast, but he was like, oh, yeah, I've heard of that. And I can't remember if he played it or wanted to play it or but. It, it, it was it was an RPG. It was fun to go up. It, it hit my uh, I haven't played a Heroes of Might and Magic game in like 15 years, but I remember them quite fondly and had a little bit of that. But the uh, match three combat kind of fun stuff. Is it a good replacement for us people who've been chasing that puzzle quest high for decades? Yes, it really is. 100%. I've been, I don't that know is... why there haven't been more games like Puzzle Quest, but I'll happily play a game like Puzzle Quest that isn't Puzzle Quest. Yeah. Did you play the remake for the Switch? I did, and I actually played it on the hardest difficulty, and I had no trouble until I hit a bizarre glitch in one of the new quests. Mm -hmm. The hardest, the highest difficulty gives you like a new class, and I think you fight a character in that class as a boss. And for some reason, if you're winning, the game crashes. Oh. Okay. Like, it was very weird. I don't know how I managed to do it, but at some point I managed to figure out a way to win it. It was something like once your score got over theirs, or you, their score was lower than yours, I should say, uh, something happened to cause the game to just crash. And I don't know how I did it, but I did it. And then I go to fight um, the final boss, and I don't know what it is, but he was impossible. On the highest difficulty, there's a chance you don't even get a turn before Holy he beats shit. you. I was like, this is impossible. The difficulty was so high. I was like, I would, he would do, I think it's because um, the cost of all of his spells are really low. And mm -hmm. so he's just casting all these incredibly powerful spells that help chain into another set of, uh, to give him a new turn, which you'd use the spells again. And by the time you get your turn, you've lost almost all your health. You do like you you match a couple skulls, maybe you get energy, and then he gets his next turn, he knocks you out. It was ridiculous. Could not do it. So I've I've done every single quest in that entire game. I've done every little side thing you can do in that game. Cannot get past the final boss on the hardest difficulty. And after all that, I refuse to not beat the game on the highest difficulty. I'm not bumping it down to easy or normal <laughs> on the very last boss of a 40-hour game. <laughs> I am going to beat him on the hardest difficulty. So I, I, ha I have not beaten the Switch version just yet. Damn, you're a, you're more of a puzzler than me. Oh, yeah. But well, I, you know what? And once that remake came out, I was like, cool. And then, then um, earlier this year, I know um, one of our people that works for RP Gamer uh, has seen me comment on a bunch. And one of the guys who hands out the review codes was like, hey, um, I think I can get you a preview for the PC version and you could actually get into a like developer chat. Are you free like Tuesday at 10 a.m.? I was like, uh, no, I work. <laughs> Sorry, can't, can't do that. And He's free on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Yeah, I was like, uh, well, I guess people who actually like work 
in the game coverage industry could be on a call and whatever. I was like, yeah, I, we're all just volunteers. I can't do that. So uh, I didn't didn't hear back from him about anything. And he thought he could get me an early build. And then it popped up on mobile, um, a demo, like shortly afterwards. So I downloaded it and I'm like, no, no, this is not. I did not like the combat. I did not like the feel of it. It just wasn't. Puzzle Quest? It wasn't Puzzle Quest. It was like somebody bought the IP, yeah. gave it to a mobile developer, and was like, here, I remember the, the name on it, had some shit. sort of puzzle. I-, I was okay with the second game. It definitely was not the first. It wasn't as good. It, it And, you know, this is the, the slope has continued to go down. So <laughs> the, the first game was like lightning in a bottle. I haven't found a game yep. like it since. So uh, this one might be worth your while. I know oh. I... Uh, I'll definitely it on my hack one. Uh, it's on eBay for about twenty dollars if you just want the game cart. Perfect. But I, I, I think it that, that that's the DS version. I it, there's iOS, there's Android versions, P, PS3, and you know it might be on the PSN or Xbox store too. It's all over the place. PC. So I'm sure everywhere else would probably be cheaper than getting a physical cart for twenty bucks. But Evan, you got one more trilogy right. to talk about. Speaking of games where I had to crank yeah. the volume down in the final boss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my last trilogy of trilogies is the Banner Saga. There is actually one more thing that kind of makes all come full circle. Every ga- every uh, first every every game in this trilogy or this every trilogy, uh, I had to drop and then I came back to. I had I had played the entirety of the first Banner Saga. There was a very long gap between the first and the second. For some reason, it couldn't. Really, for some reason, the second game couldn't run on my PC when the first one could, so I had to wait until finally that it came to the Switch in a complete package. And uh, it was it absolutely ex- this game, this series like exceeds all expectations. Blown away. So basically, it takes place in a world inspired by like Norse mythology, where the gods have all died. Um, the whole world is gray. There's no sun. So you you the whole world is is no night or day it's just a gray mess um throughout the game you get like this feeling that the world is on like a decline like you feel like the apocalypse is going to come two three hundred years from now something like that and part of it's because um in this world there is this race called the varl and they're basically giant humans with uh horns and they were handmade by one of the now dead gods and they cannot breed they're all male so they're like doomed to extinction so you have this race of creatures that you have to live with in your in this world and they're pretty much doomed hundreds of years from now to just die out and that's it um but to make matters worse in this world there were these creatures called the dredge they're like these armored monster things and at one point they were defeated but now out of nowhere they have come back and they're completely invading the whole this whole world and so you play from the point of view of this uh, human from a village called Skoger. He is the hero is named Rook and you take your daughter Alette who both of you are hunters and you flee with your Varl friend Ivor and you're in search of safety with the rest of the villagers from your hometown. And so as you travel you you have clansmen and fighters with you and Varl will pick up along the way as well and they'll leave and join depending on various decisions you make throughout the game you might make a decision that costs you a couple clansmen in a in a scuffle or thieves come and take some of your people think little things like that they can uh as you travel there's like a a, a time passes and so you'll go through supplies and the more people in you have with you the more supplies are required to make it a day and so it's measured by you know you need this number of supplies to make it this number of days and as you travel you're you just it's this caravan of people and then you're faced with like a a option it's like you stop in the forest and this thing happens and that thing happens and you get your list of choices and what i really like about this game is there's no do the good thing do the bad thing, do the neutral thing options. It's what option is going to cause the least bad thing to happen. Most of your choices are, you know, you, what what sounds like the right thing actually will result in a, you losing a bunch of your supplies. If you're like, oh, these two people are fighting, you can't just kick the can down the road and, 
you know, come up with a neutral option where it's, oh, you guys should apologize. Sometimes you have to grab one of them and punch them. You have to choose that option to break up the fight. It, so like, you have all the, and they're all these like little things. They don't necessarily change the game, but they're like the little things that cause, you know, your party to have less food, which lowers the morale, or you might gain some, what's a resource called renown. And renown is kind of like this thing where um, it's this resource where you can upgrade your party members. You cannot up, you cannot promote, as they call it, your party members without renown. And it's very hard to come by. You oftentimes have to get involved in fights against enemies that you might not be 100% ready for just to get some renown so you can bump up your party. Sometimes you might have like one guy who's level five and the rest are all hanging at like one or two in your party. But I haven't gotten to like the kind of, so basically it's a it's a turn-based strategy RPG. And you have human units, they're like they take up one box on the grid. And then you have Varl, which take up four boxes in the grid and are a lot harder to move around, but they also have better stats. So you want to make sure you move your units just just right. You don't want to get a Varl in an area where they can't move and you have one unit worthlessly standing in a corner, not able to do anything while the rest of your characters are taking punishment from enemies. And the way the combat works is units have shield and strength stats. The strength stat is like an indicator of how much damage you can do and also is your health. So the damage you can do is also your health stat. And if that stat goes down to zero, your character dies. Um, you can target the sh- if you target an enemy's um, if you if you damage the shield, it will guarantee you doing more damage later on. So you can choose to hit their shield, which will not kill them, but will promise you higher damage at your at a later turn or from another unit. Or you can just go for their strength, which will also weaken the damage they can do to you. So it's a it's a good balance between what do I want to hit? Do I want to hit this stat? Or do I want to hit this stat? And every time a particular unit defeats an enemy, uh, they get um, they can uh, get promoted after you know kill five enemies, get promoted, kill ten enemies, get promoted. And so it incentivizes using as many units as possible. You don't just use you don't want to just use certain units or else you're gonna have a lot of overpowered characters and a lot of underpowered characters and this is important because sometimes your choice the decisions you make in the game can result in an actual unit dying there's no permadeath in battle but after a battle um they can be injured and you have to have them you have to rest for them to recover otherwise next time they're in battle they're going to be weaker so you in but um but the actual story, certain things you do in the story can kill a character. So, for example, um, I played the first game three times, and the first two times I played it, I had made a choice that resulted in a character dying. And this is the very beginning of the game. So I thought this was just a character who died for like the flavor of the story, but like, oh, this is a big deal situation, whatever. But no, they're an actual unit you can have in your party if you do if you make the correct choice in the story. And he's like a really good unit too. And similar things like that can result in characters dying, depending on what choices you make. Um one thing that like, for example, there was one instance where um you can, if I remember correctly, it was, there's a, uh, one of your characters goes, I want to train the women how to uh, fight. And if you, uh, if you encourage her, she'll train um, the women on how to use bows and arrows. And so towards the very end of the first game, you will get a new unit who can use arrows, bows and arrows, to add to your party. And she can, you know, she, she talks to you and says things. So there's like a lot, she adds flavor to it. Um, and... I think the only like kind of lame thing is um, some you can kind of tell a character could die or had died at some point in the story because they kind of slip into the background a bit um, at a certain point because that's typically, um, oh, a scene must have passed where such and such character was killed. And so they can't be plot relevant anymore. Um, they will sometimes appear saying things. You can sometimes talk to them, but they're but they're not as involved in the story anymore. I don't want to get too deep into what happens after the first game because the fun of this game is letting it 
be your own story. I would not recommend looking up any. I know I just spoiled like a a unit being added to your party, um, but I would recommend other than that, completely going in cold on choices and consequences. Like, what should I do with this thing? What should I do with that thing? Um, because it really gets to even if a lot of the choices might not be important at the end of the day, you do get a good sense of this is your story. This thing is happening because of your decisions that you made throughout the story. And I really liked how I got that vibe because a lot of those like telltale games and such, you know, they'll give you a choice and then, but it's really like do the good thing or do the bad thing or here are two morally gray options. I it's, it's, it's not as interesting as should I, you know, stay in this village and wait for someone in hopes they'll come and waste all my supplies? Should I destroy this bridge and ruin relations between these two races? Or should we run away? Um, should I fortify this thing? Should I do that thing? And it, it, uh, you, you, it's, you are rewarded for making your choices regardless of what happens whether it kills a character uh injures them um makes them drop off the game for the rest of the game or completely hollows out your caravan of characters it's it's just a very fun game to go in completely uh, as blind as uh, possible and another fun thing is um if you've ever played the ps3 game journey it has the uh, composer for that game also composed for the music for this game so so uh, th- this uh, platy, you can kind of cover your ears for this part. I would recommend playing this game with headphones on for the sound. It really pops with headphones. Lou, yeah, what think- did he just say? I wasn't listening. <laughs> I had it yes, muted. But yes, oh. I, would rec- I would recommend these games. The cool thing about <laughs> them is they're actually really short. It's three games, seven hours or so long each. So it's, but it's really, I would recommend you play them all in a row. Don't take a break between them. Um, so it's really more like a one 21 hour game, 21 to 30 hour game. So again, a weekend for Blue Star. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All I keep oh. thinking about, you keep saying it's your story, and I just keep yeah. thinking of Dragon, Dragon Quest, Quest, your story. story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is definitely your story. I had a lot of fun going into it. Uh, from what decisions should I make? You know, sometimes the really bad sounding decision is actually the absolutely best possible option you could have possibly made and sometimes you're even rewarded for it so there's there's no oh this is clearly the right choice this is clearly the wrong choice of it but yes it is a very fun game to play i i actually find the the uh, the combat is serviceable um i didn't hate it i enjoyed it uh a lot but i do think the story parts are where it really shines um and I will say uh, the subsequent the games after one are a lot easier because you get more units and it's a little bit more generous in uh, leveling up. So you don't bump into this weird thing that I hit where I was humming along just fine, kind of bumping into some problems, but I can work through them. And then all of a sudden hitting the final boss and getting completely ripped to shreds, which is unfortunate, too, because halfway through the final boss, there's a scene that happens and it completely kills the drama of that scene when i have to keep playing it over and over and over again so i ended up just for this third playthrough i bumped it down immediately to easy and it was a, <laughs> and i still almost lost that was what drove me crazy i still almost lost on easy after playing the whole game on normal perfectly fine well gee you gotta turn in your gamer card then oh i am not an epic gamer let me tell you <laughs> remember he just hit the cross button a lot in oh yeah naruto <laughs> exactly you're not even wrong i played so many games on just easy mode oh Catherine. oh i didn't even i had the game set to easy immediately when the switch version came out <laughs> all right well uh i think that wraps it up i am going to right before we uh end it here i uh, that matt craft had to uh leave us tonight a bit early too and he wanted to uh share some stuff with pokemon but he had sent me his thoughts on pokemon earlier so i will throw them in right here let matt craft have a couple minutes of pokemon and then we'll get to our ending and my third one is going to be very quick over the last few weeks i have been playing a copy of pokemon scarlet my boss got it for me actually from my job 
Thank you, Angel. And I honestly never thought I would be taken in by a Pokemon game. I was pretty much done after I think black and white when I find when my old DS has finally crapped out on me for good. After that, I couldn't get into Pokemon again. I didn't play Sword and Shield. I didn't play Arceus. I didn't play anything on the DS after black and white, I think. And from the moment I turned it on, it, there was something about it that just kind of hit me the right way. And I think, honestly, is the ov overall open world patterning of the game. I love it. It pushes you along through it, it through its initial, maybe, I'd say, hour-long or so tutorial. And then once it drops you into the world, you're free to go. Do your own thing. I mean, the first thing I freaking did was look up clothing shops, and I went halfway across the world to buy my character a new outfit that I wanted. And it did not stop me in any way, shape, or turn. Had to go around a Team Star base, but hey. And then I got started. There's a couple obvious roadblocks in the game. Like in every other Pokemon game, you have to get the equivalent of your hidden machines in order to do anything but i don't know i've gotten my i've beaten my first titan pokemon and i've gotten a couple gym badges and i'd have to say it's really resonating with me i dig it you i really do so all right well that's it for this episode of slime time side quest thank you matt craft who's already left thank you yangus for the awesome intro and uh hope you had a good night but Blue and Evan, thanks for uh, sticking around to talk about your favorite games that you played this year. Yeah, anytime. Bra, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Ooh. Bob's your uncle. Bob's my uncle. Bob's the uncle. It's too late for this. I can't. <laughs> yep. And speaking of too late for this, you know what? We don't like Patreon. You can buy our t-shirt. Go to the den. Go to the forums. Listen to us wherever you're listening here. Have a bunch of stew. Have a wonderful end of the year, everybody. Good holiday season. And as Yanguis would always say, side quest complete. Yeah.